welcome to Inspirational Transformational TV Show. Amy Whitney here today with my very special guest, Jennifer Schramm. Jennifer shares so much in this interview. She shares her personal journey with an eating disorder. She shares information about self-esteem, about recovery from an eating disorder. Uh, she shares all sorts of really incredible, inspiring, insightful bits of information. It's a must-see interview. It's educational. It's inspiring. It's, it's beautiful, just like Jennifer. Absolutely beautiful. So sit back and enjoy the show. Jennifer Schramm, thank you so much for joining Inspirational Transformational TV Show. Now, generally with my guests, um, I like to do a little bit of background information. So I haven't actually even heard your story. I know the basic outline. So is it all right if I just sort of hand it over to you and you can take us through some of the um, important details that sort of led you to where you are today? Yeah, definitely. Um, so so as you, as you know, I, I focus on, I'm a life coach and counselor, and I focus a lot on um, helping people to develop self-esteem. So I work with people with eating disorders and also people with low self-esteem. And the interesting thing about the work that I do is a lot of the stuff that I teach or that I, that I um, the tools that I give people and the exercises are from my own experience. I was someone that suffered from an eating disorder myself for, for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, so through my own recovery, through my education, I've created a program to help other people. So per se, from my story, I guess from a very, we'll, we'll start off probably in my teens, but from a very young age, I was always really image conscious. Mm -hmm. Both my parents were very, very focused on the outer appearance and the way we looked and the way we dressed, um, very much focused on their own appearance and diet and, and, uh, and looking good. So, it, you know, it comes from there and society and culture. A lot of my friends, they also care a lot about what they look like and their parents cared a lot about what they looked like. Um, so I think culture played a big part in it too. Um, what we saw in the media, so what we were reading in Seventeen magazine and, and uh, what we were seeing on TV and the different characters. Um, but for myself, I think when it really first started was when I was in high school. I had a, a couple of girlfriends and we talked a lot about weight and diet and we were really obsessed with it. And I remember one girlfriend uh, in particular, her and I used to chat on the phone after school and we were like, oh, you know, like what diets we learned from our mom or from her sister or from, you know, and we'd share them. And I remember even taught, there were times when we would like try to throw up together on the phone while we were talking. It was almost normal. And we thought it was, you know, that's what you had to do to be a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and it was almost exciting. Uh, and then as I progressed through high school, I remember even going to my medical doctor and asking him for diet pills and he gave them to me and I was a teenager, not much bigger, I was never really overweight at all. Um, and if I were to look back I would think, wow that man was crazy, he gave me diet pills. Um, and then in my final year of high school I went overseas and I was in Switzerland and I started drinking like a lot of other teens do and eating the Swiss cuisine and I put on quite a bit of weight. Mm -hmm. So when I came home at Christmas, I was so scared. I was so scared that, you know, people were going to be like, you know, judge me and, and that type of thing. And uh, I landed and my parents didn't really recognize me at the airport. And I mean, I wasn't way overweight. How much weight can you gain in three months? But, you yes. know, from myself. Yes. Um, and, you know, my friends poked a little fun at me and I was wearing pants and I left the button undone just so that I thought, okay, maybe people won't notice. Um, so in that moment, I really started to really, like, just be disgusted in myself, and that's when I started using laxatives. Mm -hmm. So I started using laxatives and eating very little, so going on a restricted diet, because I didn't want that negative reaction from people. Um, and also, obviously, I had own, my own issues going on inside. Um, and uh, that's when it really, really began. And, uh, you know, I, I, the weight did come off, and, and then I went to university. And I was drinking that laxative tea like it was going out of style because, you know, I was wanted to keep up and restricting my food and, again, had a lot of friends talking about weight and diet. Yes. 
And, uh, you know, I remember even it got so bad. It was, it was really around me that I almost thought it was normal to be like this. You know, I was in a sorority and a lot of my friends, we always cared what we looked like for the like, frat parties and we would talk about diet pills and, you know, what we were doing. So it was very, I didn't realize it was a problem. Like mm -hmm. I thought, this is how a woman had to be to be successful. Yes. And, you know, I remember even one time a friend of mine, we bought this horse cough medicine off the black market because they told us it was going to make us lose weight. And I remember I had a standard car and I couldn't even drive my car because I was shaking so much from taking this stuff and I didn't care because I didn't care how it was affecting me. I was just like, you know what, I gotta lose weight, I gotta lose weight, I gotta lose weight. So I just kept doing this and actually, interestingly enough, that horse medicine was a steroid so it was working in opposite of what we thought. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. So that was pretty crazy and uh, yeah. And you know, I just kept going on it's like diet, diet, like that's all my mind ever thought about is how am I gonna lose weight, how am I gonna look good and that was it. And I even went to, this is an interesting story, I went to some diet clinics um, when I was at school. And I remember one in particular, Dr. Bernstein. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I, no, I'm not. Yeah. It's a diet where they, it's a very, very minimal amount of calories that you consume a day. And they, the doctor watches you. So your weight is monitored. Okay. And they give you some supplements and whatnot. And you lose like a, a big amount of weight in a very short period of time. And I was maybe a little bit more in weight than I am now. And they put me on it. No questions asked. So at that time, I learned how to starve myself. And I thought, well, if a doctor's even thinking I have a problem, I must really have a problem. And so I started really, I learned how to starve and to get by. And I started over-exercising. But the weird thing about it is that everyone was telling me how great I looked. So I was really sick in the head right. and really focused and really hurting and, you know, really focused on this. But, you know, my friends were telling me how great I looked. Guys were telling me how great I looked. My parents were telling me how great I looked. I thought they were proud of me. And so I was being fed by it. Like the attention was like intoxicating. So at what age? What this age is, are we at? Uh, so high school probably started like 14, 15. And then now we're in university. So okay. 20, probably okay. around 20. So a number of years going down Progressed. this path. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And it wasn't a learned overnight kind of thing. It right. kind of went and went. And I could point out a million things that, you know, things that led up to this. Or, yes. And I think really an eating disorder is having a very low sense of self. Okay. And there's a lot of different factors that, that play into it. Okay. Um, and so, you know, just to keep going a little bit, my uh, I moved to, um, I started moving you know, to oh, a little bit over the world, and I traveled for a few years, and it continued and continued, and I, you know, was, my energy was so focused on this, and, uh, you know, I got into drugs and alcohol, and I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, and I was, that's, my life consisted of thinking about what I was going to eat, how I was going to exercise it off, when I was going to binge, you know, when I was going to purge. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, 95% of my thoughts of day were consumed by that. And it wasn't until I was in my early 20s when I started to want to get better, I realized I had a problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. And when you were speaking about being surrounded by other women or girls yeah. at the time with similar thought processes, what, what is the dividing line between a disorder and just someone mm -hmm. who's kind of... Um, going to the gym for an hour a day. Yeah. I think a disordered person is like just so focused on it. Like 95% of their thoughts a day is focused around going to the gym. And if they don't go to the gym or if they don't, you know, eat a certain amount, their love of self depends on whether or not they go to the gym or whether or not they've lost weight. Whereas someone that is just going to the gym each day, okay, well, I'm going to the gym for the intention of feeling healthy. Whereas I was going to the gym to lose weight. Okay. Right? To lose weight in, a, in an unhealthy manner. And did you get to the point where the outside people in your life noticed you had an issue or it was you who, who threw the flag up in the air? It's interesting because I, no one really around me ever said anything to me. Okay. If anything, it was like you're drinking too much or something like that. Um, and you know, my parents were, I was living with them and they were like, stop doing that because they knew I was doing something, but they just thought, you don't realize how mental I think it is, right? Right. Um, and so, yeah, no, but I was crying for help. Like I wanted someone to, to notice cause I felt like I was falling and no one understood. Yes. I remember even going to a bowel specialist and I went cause my stomach cramps were so bad 
And uh, I wanted to stop, but I didn't know how. And I explained it to him, and he actually said to me, Jennifer, I want you to sit or eat, an, eat a bowl of all bran every morning, sit on the toilet, train yourself like a dog to go to the bathroom. Very sensitive. And yes, and so that was, but he didn't get it. Like, yes. you know, when I went to my family doctor and I explained to him, I think I have an eating disorder, and he said, okay, and he just got out his prescription pad and wrote me a prescription for antidepressants, and off I went. So I didn't. I never really felt validated. It was I was trying to explain what I had, but I never felt like anyone got it. So yes. I felt very alone. Where was the turning point? When did you get help? Actually, I, I met after that. I I was like, there's got to be something, or I don't really know. You know, I felt very def deflated and defeated. But mm. I met an energy therapist slash counselor, mm. and I remember going into her office and telling her my story, and she just validated me. She said, wow, you, this is very serious. You're really sick. Like, you are lucky to be alive. Because I was telling her how many laxatives I was taking a day. And it was a very serious number, and it was very serious, the abuse that she could even see on my body. My stomach was distended. My feet were purple. You know, I was, had very, very little hydration. Mm -hmm. I was fainting all the time. You know, I was anxious or I was depressed. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's when you started on your yeah. path to recovery. Yeah, definitely. Like, I I felt hurt. And don't get me wrong, it is one little step after one little step after one little step. Um, yes, she validated me and I started to get better, but that didn't mean that I gave up the behavior right away. It took a while until it started to wean away. And it, and it takes a lot of work, though. I remember on the phone you said something about, um, you know, having addressed your stuff mm -hmm. it's 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 eating disorders are classified as a mental illness is that mm -hmm, correct mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so it's a thing that you need to do therapy for to yeah. recover yeah is that how it works yeah yeah I, I don't think that you can do this alone because you're so caught in that cycle and it is all mental it's all up right. here and so until you learn new behaviors or become aware of what's going on up here you can't really change. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a really good therapy for this, so it's a part about getting to know what's going on up here and how your thoughts are affecting how you feel and different ways of changing those thoughts. Awesome. So um, can you tell a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy? Yeah. So cognitive behavioral therapy is basically what you, you work with the mind. So you okay. start to become, you know, there's a book, a great book called Mind Over Mood. Okay. And you start to work with the mind. You start to notice. Wow, okay. Noticing your moods and noticing the thoughts that might have happened before the mood. Noticing the thoughts after the mood. So you really take note of what's going on up here and create a lot of awareness in your mind. And then you start to, to monitor or write down how those thoughts are affecting how you feel. And then you work with reframing those thoughts so you're choosing better feeling thoughts. I love it. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of really great material on it. So I think that was one of the things was starting to become, in my own healing, was to become aware of my thoughts. Yes. And I really, it, you know, if I can go the, 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 a little step further, you know, there's five things, five areas. And the first one is the thoughts. Okay. So, like, really becoming aware of our thoughts and realizing how our thoughts are be affecting how, how, how we feel. Mm -hmm. And then looking at our feelings. So creating a relationship with our feelings. So I know when I first started to get better and was in counseling and, you know, learning tools, I didn't think it was okay to have feelings. So I used my eating disorder to take care of my feelings. Yes. So when I was happy, I would binge and purge. When I was sad, I would binge and purge. When I was lonely, I would binge and purge. It was like, because I didn't know what to do with my feelings. So it was learning, okay, well, you know what, my feelings might have a message, or, you know, feelings aren't meant to piss me off, they're meant to be processed, or meant to tell me something, or, yes. you know, I started to watch them. And then spiritually, so developing a connection, and really starting to pay attention to my own intuition, and my own inner wisdom, and, you know, seeing how we, you know, we all um, are connected in some way, and finding my purpose. Mm. And then, what else? Physically. So, looking at my physical body as something to, you know, something that allows me to experience the world rather than something to be perfected. You know, it's a, I, I became grateful for my body. So I looked at it as, wow, I have eyes to allow me to, to see or ears to allow me to hear rather than, I've got to get these hips skinnier or my stomach is so fat. It was like, wow, my little stomach allows me to digest and it, you know, it, it, it processes the food and it allows me to, and I just realized, wow, there's such a bigger picture than trying to perfect it. And I started to look at my uniqueness of my body rather than trying to shove it in a little box. That's beautiful. Yeah. I really, I love that. It's um, mm -hmm. 
like it's such a key thing because um, y y it's very rare in media that you hear that interpretation uh -huh. of the body. Uh -huh. It's always either so um, functional or ignored or put down. Uh -huh. So I just love what you just said. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Yeah, no, it, and, and it's huge because exactly what you're saying. It's like, how can we make it better? How can we make our lips fatter or our eyes bigger? But what is perfect, really? Yes. Yeah, right? We need different bodies for different things. Mm. Now, was that step Was That, step that was four. four, and then five is social. So who are we surrounding ourselves with? Like who, what people are in our lives? You know, are those people that are healthy for us or unhealthy for us? Are they breeding, you know, our thought patterns or not? And really starting to surround ourselves with people that are going to help to support us on our, on our path. So finding, you know, the right person to talk to, like this energy therapist that I went to, um, because clearly the doctor didn't work for me, but it, the doctor might work for someone else. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of my friends changed too. Oh. My social circles, and you know, I remember even at one point I thought, oh my god, I don't even have any friends left, I don't know what to do. But my friends were shifting because I was shifting and changing, and I started to, to hang out with other people that were more supportive or that were going through similar things in me or wanting to learn more about themselves. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, is, I know that you work now as yeah. a counselor yeah. and you work um, specifically with, with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. um, was that as you recovered, is that what led you down that career path, or can you take us to that yeah, part of your story? for sure. Um, well, when I, uh, I always wanted, I always loved people from when I was a kid, and I always wanted to be a psychiatrist or whatever, but I was scared of blood, and I thought you had to go to medical school to be yeah. a psychiatrist. So I had a degree in psychology from, from university, but I took a turn and went into the corporate world. Um, so as I started to get better, and as I Part of my healing, I think a big part of it was me meeting this woman who was a counselor and an energy therapist. I thought, I want to be like that. I want to be like that. So that sparked me. So instead of putting all my energy into how to lose weight, I started putting it in my healing. And how could I become a healer? Or how could I become someone that can help other people on their path? So I think that had a big part too. It was giving me a new purpose or a new, a new focus for life. So I um, started getting so interested in energy healing and chakras and mm -hmm. cognitive therapy. And I was reading. I couldn't get enough books. And I was taking courses and meeting all these great new people. And uh, so I immersed myself in it. Nice. And uh, at the time, I was in the corporate world. And I remember sitting at my desk and I was like, I, I want to do this. I want to go back to school. Nice. And at that point, the behavior was gone. So I didn't. I wasn't engaged in the eating disorder behavior. It was maybe a little bit, but not not very much at all. So I thought, oh, I'm better now. You know, I can go and help people. So I go back to school, and I, I went to a program in Vancouver, and it was to learn to be a counselor and a coach, and it was a um, a uh, intensive, uh, experiential program, okay. um, full time. And uh, I remember going back, thinking, I'm just going to help everyone. But what I really <laughs> realized when I got there was my own crap I had to be looked at first. Yes. So yes, I had the behavior was gone, but my thoughts were still really bad. So I still had a really poor sense of self, and I hated myself. I didn't like myself. I didn't know who I was. I didn't even know what I liked. So mm -hmm. it was about going and figuring out what made me tick and developing my self-esteem. So learning communication skills, learning how to set boundaries, learning when to say no, learning it was okay to receive feedback, um, starting to learn how to uh, have really good self-care, so being grateful, um, learning to acknowledge myself for things rather than telling myself how crap I was all the time. I was, you know, good for you, you woke up this morning, or good for you, you, you know, did this today. So it was my own, so I went back to school and it ended up being my rehab and school. <laughs> so, Beautiful. Yeah, so that's sort of how, how the whole school thing went. And that was, I've been doing this now for, I think that was probably about six years ago. Uh, congratulations. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Healer, heal thyself, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. And still, I think what, um, what I like about what I do in, in my work is I'm always healing myself. So, yes, I don't have an eating disorder anymore, but there's always something more to heal. Always, yes. I think, throughout our whole life, we're always working on something. And self-esteem just isn't a little switch that we can turn on. It's, you know, we have to, we have to work on it each day, like flossing our teeth. Now, you've mentioned this um, a few times, self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak a little bit about what self-esteem is? Why is it important? Yeah. Take us down that road. Okay. Um, self-esteem is the way that we feel about ourselves in the inside. 
So a lot of people think, you know, I, I used to speak at high schools um, quite a bit, and I remember always saying, it's how we feel about ourselves inside. And people think, wow, self-esteem, I feel better about myself when I'm going to the gym or I'm exercising or the way I look. But really, it is the way we feel better of about ourselves on the inside, regardless of what anyone else thinks, so without any external circumstances. Um, so starting to learn, starting to um, have a very deep confidence in our inner world and in our inner self. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm thinking I need some. <laughs> everyone yeah, does, I'm everyone sure. Everyone does, for sure, definitely. I don't think we have enough self-esteem yeah. or self-confidence out there in the world. We don't. You know, we, I always say we come into this world alone and we leave this world alone, but we're like our own worst enemy. Mm. Mm. And, you know, self-esteem is really like reparenting yourself even mm. and taking a hold of your hand and encouraging you. And, you know, like if I make a mistake, it's instead of saying you idiot and da -da -da, mm. like I used to, it's okay, Jennifer, it's okay. Like, what can you learn from this? So it's, you know, a shift in, in a, what we're thinking and what our self-talk as well. Oh. I don't remember it being taught in school, but is this, you, you might know more about yeah. education this, this day and age, is this something that is coming in for our children to learn about in the school system? Yeah, not that I can see. You know, I have a few friends that are teachers and they tell me how they, some of them have taken coaching, coaching classes and will, will learn, you know, different types of um, feedback, but it's not in the curriculum. Right. Which I think is really unfortunate because, you know, I go back to when I went back to school later on in life to become a counselor and coach and I thought, wow, if I had known these things, like setting yes. boundaries, assertiveness, yes. or telling someone how I feel, I would have saved myself a lot of pain over the years. But we're not taught that in schools, which I think is, you know, really interesting. And I think hope I'm hoping, you know, as time progresses and as curriculums I think I hear are maybe starting to change now, that they're gonna incorporate a little bit more of these skills in it because we don't learn it. We don't learn how to take care of our finances. We don't learn how to I remember my the only thing I learned was I had a parenting class and I carried around an egg. <laughs> That's about as far as it went. And how'd the egg go? I think the egg was broken a couple of times. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now you work a lot with self esteem yeah. in your practice. Do you yeah. want to share with the audience a little bit about your practice, about the courses yeah. that you offer? Yeah. Um, so I have a one-on-one -on -one practice and basically it's very much guided by the client and what the client needs. Um, so I do telephone sessions and mm -hmm. I also do um, in-person sessions. And my program is called The Starving Self mm -hmm. and it's to help people with low self-esteem and eating disorders feed themselves with love and acceptance. So each, each person is different. So some people come every week. Some people come every second week, some people come every month. So each program is designed specifically for each unique individual's needs. Mm -hmm. So that's how the one-on-one the -on -one program um, consists of. And of course, there's tools that are similar that, that across the board that each person will learn. Um, and then I also facilitate groups. So I work at um, Sheen's Place downtown. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've developed a number of programs there where one is called the Healing Circle which is a meditation and relaxation group. Um, so meditation really helps too in the healing process of, um, of people healing from eating disorders. Um, I also do a tool kit group, um, a skill building toolkit is what it's called. Um, and basically it's an eight week program and each week we learn a different tool, a different life skill. Okay. So it could be, you know, setting boundaries. It could be building a relationship with our feelings, starting to notice what our thoughts are. So thought watching, um, meditation, journaling. So it's a variety of different Beautiful. tools. Um, and then I have another program called Getting to Know Yourself Inside Out. And that is two weeks on emotional wellness, two weeks mental wellness, two weeks physical wellness, and two weeks spiritual wellness. How beautiful. Yeah. And would you take clients that are not, um, that don't have eating disorders? Because the, uh, everything you're saying today, I'm like, mm -hmm. it is so relevant. I have a three-year-old daughter, and I'm yeah. like, these are things I want her to learn. Yeah. I want her to know. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, I do, I do work with some people that, and usually it's people with low self-esteem or someone that wants to work on their self-esteem. Right. So I have clients that, um, you know, struck. I work with, usually if someone were to come into my practice, it's usually young adults going through transformation. So, yes. you know, maybe they don't like where they are in their career right now and they're, they're working to change that. And 
or they're not happy in their life or they can't attract a relationship. And a lot of times the root of that problem is the self-esteem or their relationship with themselves. Okay. And so, yes, definitely I do have people like that in my, in my practice that don't have an eating disorder, but usually very low self-esteem. Okay. Or okay. they're trying to learn how to have build, build confidence. What a rewarding career. So uh-huh. you must see the most beautiful transformations. Yes, I do, and I and I am. Um, I love what I do. I'm so passionate about what I do, and yeah. I get to meet so many amazing people with so so much potential. Mm-hmm. And I actually learn a lot from my clients too. Nice. You know, listening to the wisdom that they bring and the insights they have on themselves, and it's interesting. A lot of the clients that I do have, it's usually something that I've struggled with. So there's that relation to you almost have a mirror sitting in front in front of you. So, wow! Mm-hmm. Wow! Constant growth. That's amazing. Constant, constant yes. growth. And, you know, like I said before, I think a very important thing for a therapist or for someone is to continuously be working on themselves. Yes. And I think for me, that's what I like about my practice is I get to keep working on myself. And my passion is actually, you know, self-development and transformation. So it works out perfectly. Good thing you came on the show then. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um... Now, there is a serious side to this because um, we're talking about success stories of people who who are fortunate to work with you. Now, I'm not very good with statistics, but I read somewhere that the the mental illness with the highest uh, death rate is actually anorexia. Yeah, it is. Um, Can we switch gears a bit and let's talk about eating disorders. Let's talk about... um, how how does it how does it get to that point? How are how are people starving themselves to death? I mean, it's um it's out of my paradigm. Mm-hmm. I, I I can't. Why is it not noticed? You know why? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times too, it's someone has to want to have help. Okay. So unless you can actually, um, unless you want the help. You, it's not going to work. So that person has to find it within themselves. So there's a lot of people that I hear, you know, like they force their spouse or their partner or their child to go and get help. But if the child or the partner doesn't want the help, you know, there's been a lot of interventions, but that has to come from within. Okay. And, you know, it just goes to show too how sick our society is or our culture is and how the low sense of self that a lot of people have. And, um, yeah, it is very, very serious. I think 15% of people with anorexia actually die from it. I, I was, I, I could almost start to cry. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, it's very serious. And, you know, what's very interesting is I was um, at uh, an eating disorder center in Arizona, and I met a doctor there, and uh, we were going on visiting the site. And he was telling me how his patients, um, he has, he works, I didn't realize this, he works with babies that are born anorexic. Because the mother, usually the mothers are obese. His research were the mothers were obese and the child wasn't getting enough nutrients because of the donuts and the heart and the different things that the parent was eating. And the child was actually born anorexic and wouldn't eat, which I felt, I don't know a lot about it, but that really opened my eyes and because I, I had no idea it could even start from the womb. Oh my goodness, because I read um, mm-hmm. on a lot of the statistics I yeah. was reading when I was doing research for this interview was that... They quoted the age range 5 to 12 as like one of the initial sort of times yeah. when it starts. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if you can even answer this. What, what, how does a 5-year-old, is it from watching their parents? Is that the... It could be, right? There's a lot of different factors. Some people say it's biological. Right. Some people say, or it's genetic, right? Okay. Some people say it's learned. I think it's a lot of different factors. You know, my a friend of mine was telling me recently how her one of her family members developed it. He was made fun of. It was a boy, and he was okay. made fun of a lot at school. And because he was overweight, and he, he gained a lot of weight, and he became anorexic. And he was, I think, nine, eight or nine. Um, so I think a lot of different factors play in. Um, and yes, definitely, there's a huge number of people that are very, very young, even at sick kids, like, you know, 9, 10, 11. Um, what are the warning bells for parents? A preoccupation with weight and diet. A lot of weight lost in a very short period of time. Okay. Um, hiding. Um, mood swings. Mood swings is very serious, like, because, you know, with the starving and not starving and a lot of mood swings. Um... People with, they'll be wearing heavy clothes or baggy clothing, and it's different for anorexia and bulimia. So anorexia, they'd be wearing a lot of baggy clothing, trying to hide hide their, their skeleton, like underneath the, their clothing. 
um, very uh, low blood sugar, which you might not be able to see, but that usually comes out in mood swings, um, or rapid loss of weight within six months. This is anorexia. Um, bulimia, you would see probably dis distended uh, stomach. Same with anorexia, you know, poor circulation. Um, sometimes the cheeks will get puffed out too from uh, lack of uh, hydration. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, poor concentration. So there's a lot of mental things and physical things. But a lot of times, so if you had have looked at me when I had bulimia, bulimia is very, very difficult to, to detect. When I had it, you wouldn't have noticed because I looked normal. Yes. I, you know, functioned, I had a job, and I was at work all day long, and, you know, I did well at my job, I, you know, looked fine, um, so it's there, it can be very difficult to detect. Wow. The, um, the number of people yeah. that are statistically recorded with an eating disorder, you working on the ground with, with this, um, with this illness, it, is, is it accurate or is there a lot more happening out there than, than what the statistics show? Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about statistics, yeah. but I definitely think that there's a lot more happening out there and it's growing. Um, you know, we have these support centers and there's so many people that are coming. And you know what I also am noticing a bit difference in trend is in males. So I never used to see men at, at uh, you know, support centers and now I do. I hear a lot more stories about men that have eating disorders. Um, so yes, and I think because of the, the new awareness of it, you know, even when I had a problem, let's say, you know, I'm looking te over 10 years ago now, doctors couldn't really detect it. And that's 10 years ago. That's, you know, eating disorders had been a around for a long time. Yes. So I think there's some that still go undetected. But as more awareness comes comes forward, you know, like with different stars having eating disorders, people become more aware of what's going on around them. And mm. so more people are coming out. Mm-hmm. Do you do any um, energy work or anything? Because you yeah, yeah. I, I used to do a lot of energy work. So when I first started my uh, business, so I practiced Reiki and pranic oh, healing, yes. um, and I apprenticed with an energy healer too. So um, I used to do quite a bit, and now I use it in my practice when I feel I you know a client might be comfortable or old clients that I used to do it on they yes. ask me for it. Um, but I actually used to practice it in um, an eating disorder center. Wow. And uh, we did it, you know, and it, people really enjoyed it. They said that it made them a lot calmer yes. and their stomach settled down often, you know, when, when, they, when they left. So they did feel the effects. And it was interesting. Each week, the same people came back. They had half an hour session and they were very committed to coming. So I, I feel like energy for my own healing played a huge, huge role in it. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone's watching this and they they don't know where to go for help. What's the first part of call? Well, I think that a really great, well, first of all, if you even recognize you might have a problem, you're, it's a huge step. <laughs> Recognizing or feeling that there's a problem, that's a huge step to, to recovery. Um, and a lot of people just won't know where to turn. There's an organization called NEDIC. It's N-E-D-I-C-A dot C-A is their website, um, the National Eating Disorders Information Center. And they have a lot of information on there. So different symptoms are on there, different articles. Um, they have a list of therapists in different provinces. This is for, it's for Canada. So um, where you can go for different support centers um, and different therapists you can see. Um, organizations, there's a lot of resources on that site, so it's a good starting spot. Um, you know, it's always great to join a support group, something, mm -hmm. you know, in this area, Toronto area, we have Sheena's Place in Toronto or yes. Danielle's Place in Burlington, um, and you know, it's a great starting point to even just give a place like that a phone call great. or to reach out for support because what's really important here is you can't do this alone. Okay. A lot of people think, oh yeah, I'm just going to do this alone. I can get on top of this. I can do it alone. I can do it alone. I'll just kick it. But you know, you need support. You need someone to walk with you and you know, help you and support you through this and realize you're not alone and someone to help you develop new skills so that you can change your behavior. Is it with you for life? That's a good question because a lot of people say that, ask that question. And my opinion, absolutely not, because I will tell you that I have not had a symptom probably in five years, or actually in five years or more. Um, and when I say that, I haven't had any thought to want to binge or purge. Um, I don't think about what I eat. 
I, it's actually quite miraculous <laughs> because I, I don't and I can't believe that I could have gone from so focused to not focused at all. Um, so yes, I absolutely, absolutely believe that you do not have to live this, this for, for the rest of your life. And a lot of people will argue with me and say that you do, but from my own experience, no, I, I think you can absolutely get over it. Absolutely. And where to from here with you, like even just hearing, say, the past decade, it sounds like you're, you're a woman on a mission. You've mm -hmm. got so much to give. Do you have any projects coming up or anything that, um, that you have your eye on that you're, um, you're going to be releasing into the world? Yeah, well, actually, um, <laughs> I am working on, as I mentioned, my program is called The Starving Self. So I'm trying to create an online community. Okay. Um, somewhere people with eating disorders or low self-esteem can go. I'm not sure how this is looking like yet, but it's in the creation uh, process right now. So there'll be resources or support groups and teleclasses as well. Um, and uh, I, again, I, I want to make it more accessible and really to have, to create some even type of online space. Because a lot of people are really afraid to even come forth and show their face yes. when they when they have an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to have a place where people can come to get those types of tools. So right now I have the one on one and I do some groups, but I'm trying to change it over so there will be tele sessions that will be um, available. And I'm also uh, in the process of writing a book too. So mm -hmm. congratulations! Yeah. I knew I see I could just I could feel it. You've got that <laughs> that like you know so much is yet to come yeah, sort definitely. of feeling. So that's fantastic yeah. because it, you know I I've been there, so I know how horrible it can feel and how alone you feel. And there's so many books that helped me or things along my path and. And I remember even when I was getting better, it was the one thing that kept me going, how can I help other people? How can I help other people? So, so now it has become my passion. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It bubbles out of you. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. Can you um, describe, I don't even know if this is possible, and maybe we'll have to cut this out, but like the way that you, um, the way that you felt in your daily life when you were ill mm -hmm. versus how you feel now and the reason I'm asking that is because I'm hoping people out there if, if they hear the transformation that you've gone through mm -hmm. on that sort of almost energetic emotional level mm -hmm. um, it'll be a motivation mm -hmm. tool okay for sure it's a it's a kind of a tricky question I'm not sure if you know the angle I'm sort of coming yeah from, no it's a good question so describing how I <laughs> what was my day was like before? Yeah, and just and what the, my day was like now. Yeah. Well, I had a job in a corporate world, and my day was pretty much getting my work done. But while that was happening, every ninety-five percent of my thoughts all day long was, "What am I going to eat? When am I going to make time to to take my laxatives and have the release? When am I when am I going to go to the grocery store?" what I'm going to say to someone because I can't stay late and I had to like, you know, um, my day was all, like, I would say 95% of my energy went into what am I going to eat, how am I going to look, how am I going to starve myself, how am I going to binge, how am I going to purge, you know, or beating myself up about how horrible I was, what an idiot I am, how stupid I am, and having anxiety about like little things that I did all day long. And I was extremely dramatic. I always had this dramatic story about what had happened to me and what I had just done. And I was a very toxic person in a corporate world. <laughs> so that was pretty much, and there was always some kind of a drama in my life, something that I had done the weekend before, or I'd been out drinking or whatever. So that was how I lived before. <laughs> I guess now, I don't really think about food. I, you know, I go to bed and I, um, I do a lot of fun things. So, you know, I, um, I haven't been doing so much so lately, but I have a passion for riding horses. So I ride mm. horses. I read a lot. Um, I like to go to movies and I ski and I, I make time for myself. And I really immerse myself in my work and helping people and I feel present in my work whereas before I was just okay let's just get the job done and I didn't like what I was doing I actually hated my job and dreaded going to work and now I wake up in the morning excited for my day excited of course there's things that happen in my day but I really love what I do um, you know I, before I attracted very unhealthy relationships with men very unhealthy relationships with men and they were short-lived and very toxic um, and now I have a, a very healthy relationship with someone. Uh, so that area of my life has definitely changed. Um, before I didn't know how to say no. 
so I would do things when I didn't want to do things, or I would hang out with people I didn't want to hang out, or I would gossip about people and say really horrible things about people because I felt really bad about myself. And now I really work towards surrounding pe myself with people I feel really good around. Um, people that um, are along the same path and that uh, you know, want to do good in the world and want to take care of themselves and are you know, committed to, to self-care in transformation. Um, I'm just looking at the different areas. So career, work, relationships. My family, my relationships with my family were horrible, horrible growing up. Mm -hmm. With my mother especially. Um, and my father. And I was mean. I was really mean. And now my relationships with my parents are really, really good. I love spending time with them. I'm very close with them. Um, so that's definitely changed. Uh, leisure, spent having more time fine before I would force myself to do things I didn't like doing. And, you know, my health, like I really, you know, I, the transformation was in my body. Like I really care about my body now. And I care about how I feel. And I care about, um, you know, if I'm tired, I want myself to sleep. Like I, I take care of me. Or if I feel like I made a mistake, I'm like, it's okay, Jennifer. You know, before it was like, you idiot, and you know, I'd beat myself up all day long, or I would, you know, abuse my body. So it's really shifted in that way. Does that answer your question? It's beautiful. Okay. It's exactly, it's, mm -hmm. uh, that is so poignant, and so, um, it's, it's like, who wouldn't choose to, to, to go down the path of loving themselves, mm -hmm. you know, when you do hear the different um, process of living. Yeah. The same person, different thought process. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, again, one thing I really want to reiterate, if anyone is sitting out there that does have an eating disorder and feels hopeless in it, you know, it really starts with one step and then another step and then another step. Like this did not happen overnight. It was one small step after another with a lot of setbacks, a lot of setbacks. So, you know, if there is a setback, it's okay. It's like, okay, let's pick ourselves back up and get back on the, on the healing bandwagon. So mm -hmm. it's one little step after one little step after one little step. What was your biggest inspiration? My biggest inspiration was that woman, that woman that I went to, the energy therapist. Yes. Um, she was, I don't know, I just was so interested in what she did and uh, I wanted to be like her and that really inspired me because when I met her I thought, this is what I want to do and I think that kept pulling me towards that, towards that. What do I have to learn to become yes. that? And now you're in that role for other young mm -hmm. people, which mm -hmm. is just beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. And your final words of wisdom today. My final words of wisdom. Well, definitely you can heal from an eating disorder. So for any people out there that do have an eating disorder, it is absolutely possible to heal. And there's always a really big gift in your eating disorder if you look at it that way. Amazing. Yeah. And it just starts with one little small step and then another and then another and then another. Beautiful. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today, for sharing your story, for being so open, honest, radiant, beautiful. You are an absolute inspiration. I'm so excited to see where you're going next. I know you're writing a book and a, an online course, um, but there is so much more to come from you. You are an absolute blessing, a beautiful woman to know, and Thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Much love and many blessings to you.